But uh, thank you for joining us today. That we're going to cover battery testing today. We're going to limit, you know, really to just battery testing. A little bit about batteries. Um, but we do have some other uh, webinars planned already. The next one will be uh, voltage drop testing, which is kind of a continuation from here. But we're going to start off with with battery testing, and Jimmy's going to kick us off. Thanks everybody for joining. Like Larry said, um, first off, we're going to talk a little bit about battery 101. Uh, Larry's going to present. Um, how to build a basic battery. Then we're going to introduce the, some of the proper procedures um, for load testing batteries and explain why these procedures are important. First off, I want to make sure we're all talking the same electrical language. When we're talking about volts, we're talking about that electrical pressure, that force behind that current flow. And that, that is measured on a voltmeter as voltage. And it's the difference in electrical pressure between two points in a the circuit. Then when we talk about amps or amperage, that's the actual flow, uh, the actual current flow, the flow of electrons. I like to compare this to you know, water in a pipe. Uh, the more pressure you have or the more, more, sorry, the more electrical pressure you have behind that, um, the more that current will flow. This example here, I show a, a battery, just a basic diagram of battery and a starter. Um, but the point I want to get across here is what comes out of that battery must go back to that battery. So you see we got 600 amps that that starter is pulling from that battery through the positive cable. It has to go back through the negative cable. And the same rules apply when you're doing a load test. So now Larry's going to kind of explain how to build that basic battery. All right. That one time we talk about a basic battery, a lot of us either, you know, we're in school or now we got kids in school. That's uh, a lot of times for a science fair project, but a neat thing you can do is you can build a very basic battery. And if you look at any type of a battery, it's always two dissimilar metals in an acid solution. So way back, you know, uh, for a science fair project, you take a lemon and take a nickel and a penny, two different metals, lemon is an acid solution. You can solder a wire to those, that nickel and uh, penny, slide them into that, and you can actually power a little digital watch. Um, kids will think you're the, the smartest person on earth. Don't tell me you're different, but uh, that is, again, a very basic battery. We're going to do the same thing what a, you know, a Group 31 or a truck battery uh, is today. But when we talk about it, and we're just going to show one cell for right now, but um, we have a case and a separator. And if you notice, we have the, the red here is the positive plate, which is made out of lead dioxide. The gray is the negative plate, which is made out of sponge lead. And even though they're both lead, chemically, they're two totally different metals. And we're going to put those into an acid solution or electrolyte. Electrolyte's made of 64% water, 36% sulfuric acid. When that battery is 100% charge, it has a specific gravity of 1.270. What does that mean? Because of the amount of acid in that water, this electrolyte weighs 1.27 times as much as an equal volume of water. So we have this battery 100% right now. But we can take that battery, we're going to, you know, headlights or, you know, uh, cranking the engine or load test or whatever, but we're going to put a load on this battery. We're going to pull it down. So we're taking that energy out of that battery, and so what actually happens is we are driving that acid out of suspension into the plates, and if we continue to discharge this battery all the way down to nothing, we wind up with all that acid into the plates, and what's left is basically pure water. So if you were to check this battery right now with a hydrometer, what would you find? You have 1.0, or basically water, because all that acid has been driven into the plates. Because both of those plates are now uh, fully saturated with the acid, we have two similar metals in a water solution, which basically says we just made a paperweight. Now, unlike that lemon, what can we do with a lead acid battery? We can reverse the current using a battery charge or alternator or whatever, but we can put energy back into that battery. So current's going the opposite direction. As we do it, we drive that acid back out of the plates into the water and we take that battery back up to 100%, we are back at that 1.27 specific gravity, saying that battery is fully charged again. Now, again, you got to keep in mind one thing about 
you know, using the hydrometer to check a battery or what this number tells you, all that says is that battery is charged. Same thing, we put a voltmeter across the battery. It says, hey, the battery's at 12.6, it's charged. Does that mean the battery's good? No, simply says that it is charged. A couple of things we always want to look at too when we talk about batteries is battery ratings. That's, you know, one of the, the biggest ones everybody else looks at is CCA. And what is CCA? It's the cold crank amperage rating of a battery. And that is, you know, a, a test done by Battery Council International says, we're going to see what this battery can give off at zero degrees and maintain at least 1.2 volts per cell at the end of that test. That's how they, again, put those ratings on batteries. It's also how they came up with the test to test these batteries. But it's simply that battery's ability to give off a burst of energy. Now, everybody wants to look at this on batteries, and sometimes, well, yeah, may not really be the thing you want to look at when you choose batteries, because what's actually more important now is reserve capacity. You know, we, we ask those batteries to crank an engine, but more importantly, what are we asking those batteries to do? We're asking those batteries to be able to provide all the key off uh, loads, whether he's sitting in a truck stop, you know, using the inverter, watching TV, popping popcorn, got a crock pot going, whatever, is that battery to be able to give that energy off long term, and at the end of it still be able to crank that battery, or be able to crank that engine. So reserve capacity is a very, you know, uh, important number to look at, because it's, you know, a rating of that battery, how long in minutes can it give 25 amps and maintain a terminal voltage at least 1.75 volts per cell or 10.5 volts? It really kind of goes back to the idea, too, that if you're going down the road and you lost an alternator, if you turned off all non-essential loads, how long would that truck be able to run before it would shut off because of low voltage? So, uh, very important test and also these two play a point in how well that battery cycles. And that's the biggest thing we look for in batteries is, is cycle life. When we talk about uh, energy on batteries, it doesn't matter if we're taking energy out or putting energy back in, it's all a matter of amper hours. That if you have a one amp load on the battery and you leave it on for one hour, that is one amper hour. If it's a 10 amp load and it's on for one hour, that's 10 amper hours. One amp load, 10 hours, same numbers, we just reversed them, whether it was, you know, current or time. And that gives us our amp hour. So 10 amps, 10 hours, 100 amp hours. Each battery, a typical Group 31 battery, is around 100 amp hours of energy. Most trucks, we have four of them, so you'd have a total of 400 amp hours of energy. Now, this is very important when we talk about it, because a lot of times a driver may leave something... Uh, turned on and doesn't realize what he's doing to those batteries. Well, it's only a this or it's only a that. And it doesn't matter, you know, if it's a big load or a small load, time is your biggest killer on that. So uh, uh, if you ask a driver what he left on, you know, what's his number one response? Nothing. In his mind, he didn't leave anything on. Uh, or what he was, you know, left on, well, that shouldn't be that big a deal. It's only one amp or two amps or whatever. Well, uh, the same thing can apply to a technician that goes out and he's going to work on a truck. Uh, batteries are low, so I'm going to, you know, charge them before I try to load test them. He takes the, the shop charger, uh, say it's a, a 50 amp charger, kicks it on, leaves it on for a half hour. How much energy did he really put back in those batteries? Well, it's a 50 amp charger and it's on for half an hour. You only put 25 amp hours back into those batteries. If you have a 400 amp hour battery back and you put 25 amp hours back into it, did you really charge them? No, but a lot of times people think they do when they try to load test those batteries, and for some reason they fail miserably. Are they bad batteries? No, they're still simply not charged. I kind of ran this just as an example for people to see, you know, what does all this mean? Is we've got three different scenarios here. Is the first one is. Uh, you're going to crank an engine. Uh, it's going to pull 1,200 amps. You're going to crank it for 15 seconds. You're going to do that five or 10 times in a row. Even though that is a lot of current, it is a very short period of time, and even those cranks, it only adds up to five amp hours. Second scenario, and everybody can relate to this one, because how many times have we found a refrigerator left on in a, the sleeper of a truck? So it's only four amps, but it was on for 72 hours. It's a three-day, you know, Labor Day weekend, Memorial weekend, whatever. 
is that 72 hours times 4 amps equated to 288 amp -hour hours. Out of 400, those batteries are pretty well dead now. Third scenario is lights left on during a delivery. Uh, 2 amps, or sorry, uh, 2 hours times 40 amps, that equates to 80 amp -hour hours. So that's still less than a fourth of the battery. But what you do have to be careful about is did you make that delivery and then drive three blocks and do it again? Now it just became 180 amp hour or 160 amp hours, and you had five minutes or 10 minutes of drive time in between, so you create a, uh, a stair step uh, road to, to failure there. So uh, these are very important things for someone to realize, not only what a driver does, but also what does a technician do. The key point to that is wherever you take out of those batteries, you must, you must put that back in. Yes. We just graph these just so you can kind of see what those differences are. Um, and when you look at, you know, cycling of a battery, a battery's a lot like a paper clip. If you take that paper clip and you barely bend it back and forth, how many times can you do it before it breaks? I don't know, I got bored. But if you take that same paper clip and bend it all the way back and forth, it's going to break in a couple of times. You know, oversimplification, but that's exactly what we do to batteries. The harder and lower depth of discharge we take them, the shorter life we're going to have. We'll let Jimmy take over now. We got a poll question for you. So grab your mouse and uh, see what you can do on this question. All right, everybody. So the first question is what causes a battery to fail? First one being maintaining the battery at a low state of charge, excessive deep cycling, excessive vibration, or the last one is all of the above. And I'll give you a minute to uh, give everybody time to answer that question. So if you hit submit, or to tally those, see how everybody did. Okay, next slide. All right, so it looks like um, everybody would agree that all of them, um, you know, maintaining the battery at a low state of charge, excessive deep cycling, excessive vibration, all those play a key role in um, your battery life. We have a question here. I just had a question pop up. Okay, one uh, question we had pop up was in uh, reference to sulfation. Um, you know, what is sulfation? Sulfation is when you actually you'll get uh, the plates will develop a uh, crystal structure of all the, the paste material. What causes it? Um, usually it's batteries left in a discharge condition over an extended period of time. With most fleets that's not really an issue uh, because the vehicles are out being ran. Uh, how can it be prevented? Um, if you do have vehicles that are going to be parked extended periods of time, Make sure they are at a 100% state of charge. One of the best things you can ever do with parked vehicles is charge them, pull the battery cables. You know, no matter what, we have electronics on trucks for memories, radios, uh, ECMs, all those things are always going to pull some power. So the best thing you can do is uh, uh, park them at 100%, pull the cables, and, and they should be able to uh, live in those environments. To re reverse it, there is equipment, but more often than not, a lot of times, that's not really why people are having issues. It's not sulfation because, again, sulfation really happens from being batteries being left in prolonged periods in a low uh, state of charge. Okay, so we're going to go into a uh, another poll question. What do you consider to be the average battery life at your company? First one being three months, six months, one year, or five years. So we'll give you a minute to uh, pick up your mouse and click on on your answer.
Okay, so we're going to go into the next slide and look at the results. So it looks like everybody would agree that five years, that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, we got 4% about six months out of their batteries, um, which is, that's not normal. That's six months is pretty short battery life. 32% um, get a year, um, but it looks like the majority is getting pretty good battery life. So that's good. Alrighty. On this slide, well, all we're really showing is again we talk about that that oversimplification of the paperclip. That if you look at this on the the left column, that is number of cycles, and this is a, a SAE standard for cycling because um, it's got to be the same amount of depth of discharge, whether it's a thirty percent or sixty percent or whatever. Uh, and you look at uh, number of cycles those batteries can handle. So if you, if you look on the far left, if you have a battery you hardly cycle at all, it can do, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 cycles, depending upon you know, what you're doing with that battery and how low. Uh, as you increase that depth of discharge, it very, very quickly impacts the number of cycles that battery can handle. So if you keep in mind when we showed you the, you know, what that battery is or how it works, is whenever you discharge that battery and you drive that acid into those plates, what are those plates going to do? They're going to swell. When you recharge that battery and drive that acid back out, they're going to contract. So the more you, uh, you know, uh, the harder you flex those plates from, you know, the, the depth of discharge and then recharge them, you know, those cyclings are what kills life of the battery. So uh, the more you can limit that depth of discharge, the longer life you're going to get out of those batteries. We did have another uh, question pop up here. And I'm not sure what the uh, question really was is, is in reference to, to trucks or cars. Really, when we talk about any of these things right now, the same rules apply because it's still a lead acid battery, and the same rules apply whether you park them, you recycle them, whatever. That all these things you know fit both applications. So. Next slide, one of the things too we talk about is uh, wintertime. Is batteries are like me in wintertime. The colder they are, the less they want to work. So if you take a battery and get it down, you know, zero degrees at 14 volts, which is typical, the, the high rating for a voltage regulator on a car, if that battery is that cold, how long do you think it's going to take to recharge that battery? And the answer is more than 100 hours. It takes a long time to recharge a cold soak battery. You know, one of the nice things about vehicles is they put the uh, battery under the hood with the engine. So it's going to get engine heat to warm up and, and fix that. In heavy duty uh, vehicles, whether we're talking school buses or uh, you know, class five, six, seven, eight, whatever, are those batteries in an engine compartment? No. So they're never going to pick up that heat. So uh, one of the scariest things they ever tell somebody is you don't ever want to go out there and jump start a uh, vehicle in the middle of winter and assume he's going to drive long enough to recharge those batteries. Uh, it just, you can't change physics and batteries will not accept that charge. Uh, another comparison, we're going to talk about, you know, test equipment here in a minute. And one of the biggest things that asks you anymore is type of battery you're testing, whether it's an AGM or flooded cell. And there's, there's other types of chemistry and, and everything out there, but really for the automotive, you know, heavy duty commercial market, is we either have flooded cell batteries or we have AGM. They are both lead acid batteries. A flooded cell battery has liquid electrolyte in it. And if you, you know, turn it, shake it, whatever, you can you know, see and feel that liquid move around it. With an AGM battery, they use more of a, it almost looks like cotton matting, obviously it's not cotton, but it, it's a mat um, that kind of acts like a sponge that is saturated with that acid. There's no free electrolyte. Um, there is you know, different chemical uh, different uh, characteristics about the battery that make them different. And one of the biggest things is, you know, as far as testing is state of charge. Um, an AGM battery is considered 100% state of charge at 12.8 volts. A flooded cell battery is considered 100% at 12.6. So all your test uh, criteria does change a little bit between the two batteries. So if you are using an electronic uh, type of equipment or even uh, manual, 
you do have to make sure you are testing them based on what type of battery it is. They are going to test differently, so you need to make sure which one you are using. Thank you, Larry. So now I want to I want to go into dive a little bit into battery testing. First off, we got an, another poll question. Uh, what voltage should a battery be at before conducting a load test? First one being 13.2 volts, 12.45 volts, 12 volts, or 12.2 volts. So I'll give you a minute to uh, answer those questions or that question. <coughs> Okay, so it looks like it's everybody's in favor of 12.45 volts, which is correct. 14% uh, said 13.2, um, 7% said 12 volts, 15.8% said 12.2 volts. The answer is you must be at least 12.45 volts uh, to properly load test that battery. So now going into battery testing, there's a three things that you really need to, to consider. The first thing you want to do is you want to do a physical examination of that battery. You want to take a look at the case, make sure there's no cracks, leaks. Um, really pay close attention to the, the lead posts. Um, <clears throat> some batteries have a, uh, a hydrometer with an eye on top where you can look at the state of charge of that one cell. Um, again, the, the battery, that's the heart of the electrical system, so you really need to, <coughs> to make sure it's physically everything's good. Uh, the state of charge, like we just mentioned in the last poll question, you need to determine that state of charge before you properly load test that battery. And then last, you got to apply that load. So this is, this is an example of a hydrometer. Um, like I said, some batteries have them, some don't. Um, but there's a little eye on top of that battery um, with a tube that sits down into each cell. There's a little green ball at the bottom of that tube that, depending on the specific gravity of the electrolytes, you know, depends on where that ball is going to be. So if there's the battery's at a full state of charge and that specific gravity is high, then that, that green ball is going to be right in the center of that tube, so therefore you're going to see a green dot on that eye. If the specific gravity is low, that ball is going to be shifted to the side so therefore, therefore, you're going to see the bottom of that, that tube, which is black. So you'll see a black eye. And now if you have, if you've somehow lost the electrolytes in your battery, where the electrolyte level is below where that tube is, you're going to see white, being that, that the electrolytes are, are extremely low. Um, so at that point, you need to determine why, um, why they're that low. So this is an example of a cracked battery. Um, you would not want to use that battery. You would not want to load test that battery or charge that battery. First thing I would do is figure out why that battery is in that condition. You want to check your um, check your battery hold downs. Make sure they're first off. Make sure they're there, um, and make sure they are sec you know, securing that battery properly. Uh, prevent it. You know, it's obviously probably due to vibration. So make sure those hold downs are properly installed. Next you want to pay really close attention to your, your lead posts. Um, as you can see on the left side, uh, the threads are all kind of screwed up from the, uh, you know, possibly using a power tool. Um, and you can see the, the lead pad is pretty scuffed up. That is your electrical connection. You've got to make sure that you take care of that that point. That's where all the current flows is through that lead pad. The steel, uh, the stainless steel stud is is there for an electrical connection. It's to secure those cables down to that lead pad. You can see on the right, the picture on the right, um, threads look pretty good, but the lead pad is, is dirty. So you want to make sure you clean that lead pad. Another thing to take note is look how dirty the, the battery is on the, on both sides. 
you want to clean those batteries, make sure they're clean. You can actually um, discharge a battery by having dirt on the top of it. It could can possibly conduct and slowly drain that battery. So really pay close attention to the lead posts, cleaning the batteries. Um, again, that's the heart of the electrical system. You can see in this example, um, that, that lead pad looks really clean. Um, we've got a neat little tool you could use is a battery brush. You put it on the end of a uh, cordless drill. Everybody can see that. Put that on the end of a cordless drill and zip down that, um, that lead pad and get it really clean and flat. The stainless steel stud, again, is for stability and strength only to keep those cables secure against that, that lead pad and that electrical connection. That is the primary electrical connection for this, for any electrical system. So here is showing an example of a Freightliner battery configuration. Um, and what I want to point out here is the cables. Again, you can have all the battery power in the world, but if you cannot deliver it to where it needs to go, um, what good does that do? So if you look at the, um, <coughs> look at the battery, the positive cables, and you can see sometimes they put a connection in between the, um, the inner cell connectors. A lot of people do not pay any attention to those because they are either rusted, couldn't get them loose, so they just disregard them. But that, that is your, typically that's your main cables coming in from your starter, so you've got to make sure those, those connections are clean and, and properly maintained. Let's show this other battery brush too while we're stopped here is you know, part of battery services, you know, not just do your batteries, but cleaning all your cables. So we showed you the one battery brush that's great for cleaning the batteries. There's actually another battery brush that's kind of hard to see, but it has a brush in the center. So it does a real good job of cleaning up all those cables. Um, it pilots on the uh, center brush. That it, again, if all the stuff is not clean, and you know, uh, your good friend always refers to as bright and tight. That if you, if it's not clean metal, and you put all these connections together. You're never going to be able to pass energy like you ought to be able to. And one of the things is showing the, the molded cables that's in this picture here. I don't know how many times I've been out in the field working on trucks and find casting flash on those where they didn't quite clean it up all the way. Uh, I had one that was almost completely covered on the bottom with uh, casting flash when it was made. Um, last time I checked, plastic is not a very good conductor. So you want to make sure you, you look at all those things, make sure you are getting the best connection you can. So this example showing installing a battery adapter. It's very crucial when you're low testing a battery that you use battery lead post adapters. Clipping your leads you know, directly onto the stainless steel post is not going to give you an accurate test. That stainless steel is a not a good conductor. So you must use lead post adapters and make sure that when you put you know tighten that lead post adapter down that it's seated properly and completely on that lead pad. Otherwise, you're, you're not going to get, your results are going to be skewed. Well, here's one of the lead adapters here, too. Again, kind of hard to see in the, the camera. But the nice thing about them is, again, they are lead, so they're soft. They can form very well to the lead pad on the battery. And the other thing that, uh, if you buy the right ones, you'll notice they have a steel insert in them, so they're not going to wear out prematurely. But the other thing, too, is it only requires a few turns to get them all the way down to make that good connection. These things are cheap. I'm a firm believer every technician in the shop ought to have a pair in his toolbox. Because if you only have one pair on the cart, guess what? First time a guy uses it, where does that pair of adapters wind up? In his toolbox anyway. And you have people trying to do battery tests without them. And uh, Jimmy said that stainless steel stud is there as a mechanical connection to hold the cable down onto the lead pad, which is the electrical connection. If you try to go on the stainless steel studs, you're going to damage the threads. I've seen people get them so hot they've actually melted them out of the battery. Um, that's, you know, you've got to use the, the right tools for the job and uh, lead adapters are it, whether you're lift, you know, uh, charging or load testing a battery. And we mentioned, um, you know, I mentioned earlier uh, talking about the hydrometer. You can see in this, uh, this picture here, that's what a, what an eye looks like, a hydrometer eye. In case that, you know, anybody didn't know what that was. Like I said, not all batteries have them, but that's what it would look like on yeah. top of a battery. And the key to that too is how many cells are in a battery? Six. How many hydrometers are in a battery? One. So you're only checking one cell so you can't put a whole lot of faith in it. Uh, but 
at least does give you a quick indicator. You know, hey, green light. Hey, this battery should be at a high enough state charge. I should be able to test it. And test equipment. You know, we're going to try to cover you know several different things today. Um, but if you look at the, the test equipment, they're all forms of load testers, and that's all we're going to talk about today. We're not going to talk about any type of electronic tester, but these are all actual load testers. Whether they use a carbon stack or they use resistive loads, but it's still putting an actual load on batteries. Um, the two on the left are old-fashioned carbon piles. They are manual type pieces of equipment, versus the two on the right are electronic or menu-driven. Uh, the nice thing about the, the electronic ones, they can kind of be the equalizer in the shop. Whether it's a, a guy you hired last week or a guy that's been with you 20 years, much more repeatable because the test equipment does the, a lot of the testing and, and specs for you. But when we talk about any of this stuff, is you know, we're working on a, a assumption right now we're doing a, a PM on a truck or a truck came in for a, a cranking or charging problem. So what do we have to do? We have to load test and check those batteries individually. A lot of equipment now has battery bank testing, and there's times for that test. But if you have a write-up or you're supposed to be doing a full PM, they have to be broken down and checked individually. One of the things, too, is, you know, if you're, you're going through a truck, uh, truck just came in off the road, it's been, uh, been driven for the last many hours, um, or batteries have been on a charger, those batteries can have a surface charge on them. What that means is if the battery has an open circuit voltage higher than 12.75 on a uh, flooded cell uh, or uh, about 13 volts on a AGM, that basically we have gas bubbles on those batteries. That what we want to do is apply a load on that battery first to burn those gas bubbles off so we get a fair test. That if you were to take a battery um, you know, fresh off the charger or fresh out of a truck that had been running for many hours, you could have a marginal battery or even a bad battery that may pass a load test simply because of that surface charge. So we want to make sure we burn it off first. If we're talking about the electronic equipment, again, whether it's BVA, BCTs, um, they will detect this and apply a load automatically and burn that surface charge off first. If it's a manual type piece of equipment, um, you have to use a 300 amp load. It doesn't matter if it's a 700 CCA or 950 CCA, whatever. You're still going to use the same 300 amp load for this for 15 seconds to burn those gas bubbles off. Let it sit for a few minutes and then do your actual load test. Okay, everybody grab your mouse. We've got another poll question. And the question is, the higher the CCA, the better the battery. True or false? So it looks like 83% answered false, 16% uh, answered true. Um, the answer would be false. Uh, the higher the CCA doesn't necessarily mean it's better. Um, when you get into cycling batteries like with liftgate applications, um, you want that, again, like Larry mentioned earlier, you want to look at that reserve capacity. Um, so see, you know, the CCA, the higher it is, it's not always the better. Typically in a you know cranking application like a tractor application, uh, that's where you would look at you know, some of the higher CCAs. Yeah, just keep in mind what that battery is going to be used for. That if it's a sleeper where they're going to be you know obviously sleeping in it and running all those key offloads, uh, reserve capacity is much more required because when they build a battery, they are trying to make you know uh, the best compromise between CCA and reserve capacity for the best life you can. Um, no matter what, though, people still see high or big CCA numbers and think it's the better battery. You've got to be careful what your what is that application to make sure we're getting the right battery for it. Okay, going into the actual testing of the battery, again, we're starting off talking about the electronic equipment. Um, there's many factors when we talk about the uh, uh, the testers, but in the test criteria, but if it's electronic type equipment like we showed you before. It's going to ask you what the rated CCA of that battery is. So you look on the label and make sure you put in what that battery is actually you know, labeled as. Um, a lot of battery manufacturers or different brands use the same label. Uh, so don't ever assume, well, I used a, you know, had a, a Interstate or a Delco or whatever um, that had the same label, so it must be a 700. And 
when you look at the label and it's 950. If you put the wrong criteria in, you could either either A, uh, pass a bad battery, or fail a good battery, depending upon you know how you put that criteria. The other thing we talked about before is temperature. The colder a battery is, the less efficient it is. So you're going to have to uh, scroll through and adjust that temperature for whatever that battery's temperature is. But by putting those in, it'll do all the calculations for you until you pass or fail. Same with the type of battery. That most all the equipment now has the options to test the different chemical chemistries. Um, so it's going to ask you, you know, type of battery. Is it AGM? Is it flooded cell? Um, some battery manufacturers uh, will even have their own criteria there. Um, so by brands, hey, it's it's this brand that they do test a little bit differently. So make sure you put the right one in, all the right criteria. Press start. It's going to low test it and tell you pass or fail. Um, for the most part, that's really all you want that tester to do. Um, so you, hey, it's a good battery, it's a bad battery. Some of the equipment may come back and say, hey, it's a good battery, but it needs to be charged. That it was you know a little on the low side. So before you let that truck out of here, you know hook up a shop charger, make sure you top it off before he leaves. May come up and say too low to test. Doesn't mean it's a good battery. Doesn't mean it's a bad battery. Simply is telling you, hey, it's too low to be able to do a proper test on it. You're going to have to charge it, run it through the the process, and then do the uh, test on it. We go to the next slide here. We're going to talk about manual equipment. And that was the the two pieces we showed you at the the previous slides. Is with that piece of equipment that is totally up to the operator. Uh, doesn't allow you to put any of the criteria in, so you're going to have to know uh, all the, the right things about it, and you're going to have to be able to do some math. With the manual equipment, you have to find the rated CCA of that battery. You're going to divide it in half, so it's a 700 CCA battery. You're going to put a 350 amp load on it for 15 seconds. At the end of that 15 seconds, you got to know what is that voltage before you let that load off. It's not bounce back voltage. You got to look at it while that load is still on. So you crank it down and it comes out and says that battery's at 9.2 volts. Is that a good battery or a bad battery? You have to understand the criteria. We're going to cover that in a minute, but we got one more poll question for you right quick. All right, so the question is, is it safe to jump start a totally discharged battery in a negative 32 degree temperature? Yes or no? That should be answered pretty quick. So the everybody's all in favor of 100% no. Um, it's totally unsafe to jumpstart a, a battery at a negative 32 degree temperature. Again, when we talked, to, you know, Larry talked earlier about building a battery, um, a totally discharged battery. What's left in that battery? And it's it's a water solution. So we all know that water will freeze at a negative 32 degree temperature. So we got possibility of broken connections, all kinds of nasty things can happen at that type of uh, deal. Plus, even if you jump start, you can't let that, that unit leave. It's got to come in the shop anyway. So if you get those type of uh, scenarios, the only thing you really can do is to swap those batteries. Still don't mean those batteries are bad, but you're going to have to let them sit and warm up before you can do anything. Okay, going back to our, our using our manual test before, rather than the electronic test to tell you pass or fail, is you looked at that battery and it came back as you know 9.2 under load at the end of the load test. Is that a good battery or bad battery? You have to look at this chart and see where does it fall on it. You know, what is the temperature of that battery? If that battery is at 40 degrees, that battery fails because it fell below 9.3, which is what it should be for a minimum. If it's 30 degrees, then that battery actually passes because you are above the, the minimum required. So you have to, to make sure you get a, an accurate reading when you do that load test, and you have to go back and look at your temperature chart to make sure it is a good battery for that criteria. Um, and there's good and bad to both types of pieces of equipment. Uh, some people swear by the, the old manual ones. Other people swear by the, the electronic ones. Uh, again, both of them are doing a load test on a battery where the electronic test can uh, can help more is not only they do a low test, but they also can look at the plate material length of the battery. Because with a old-fashioned uh, manual piece of equipment, all it does is a low test. If you look at how we operate trucks now, it's not just that ability to crank a battery. 
is to be able to keep, you know, provide power for those key offloads. So does he have enough energy still after he, you know, sits there for a night or, you know, whatever to still be able to crank? I've had a, a battery that passes a low test with flying colors. You put it in a truck and, and listen to the radio 10 minutes and that battery's dead. Is there anything wrong with that battery? Yes. It has the ability to give you that burst, but it had no capacity left. And that's where we get in problems with uh, uh, people just looking at state of charge of a battery uh, and assuming charge is good, and that is not the case. We just had a question come in. Uh, what if the CCA and Amper Hour AH rating are not on the label or the label is missing? That's a tough call. It depends how how often that happens to you. Um, if it's not there, there's you no way you can ooh, excuse me. There's no way you can low test that battery. Um, it's trying like uh, parachuting off the side of a building blindfolded. You don't know so how you're going to be able to low test it. Um, and again, uh, battery manufacturers just make tons of different batteries uh, that all use the same cases. So it may be a 600 CCA battery, it may be a 1,000 CCA battery. You don't know. So uh, that may be a good battery to take home, put in your fishing boat, but there's nothing else you're going to be able to do with it because you cannot properly test it. Again, going back to that tem temperature we've been talking about over and over is, if you look at temperature and how it affects a battery, the colder that battery is, the less efficient it is, but at the same time, look at what that temperature does to an engine. Nice warm day, you can crank a, you know, a Series 60 off one battery. You let that engine get colder and colder, and then your requirements go up greatly because one of the biggest factors, or actually the biggest factor on engine crankability, is oil viscosity. The colder that engine oil gets, the thicker it is, the harder it is to pump, the harder it is to crank. So that's why we, we do those things and have those uh, numbers on there because the, the cranking requirements do go up greatly with, with temperature change. We're going to open this up to any questions. One thing I would like to remind everybody, though, as, well, once we're done with questions, this is going to go to a uh, three-question survey. Please do not exit until you get a chance to answer those survey questions, because uh, this, this is feedback, so we can help make sure we're providing you the, the right training and stuff that, that you everyone asked for. So. So again, please don't leave until you, those questions do come up. Uh, we did have one question here come up. Um, let's just click on it. If the label is missing, if you know the amperage needs, if you know the amperage needs of the truck, couldn't you just load test it to that and determine if it meets the truck's needs? Technically, yes, you could, but again, that would really still be kind of a hand grenade approach to uh, whether that is a good battery or a bad battery. Um, it's still, you know, just because it could give off the energy, say they were 950s and you only you know, load test them as a as 600. Did it meet the requirements? Yes, but still, that battery has lost so much material and capacity that you're setting yourself up for a road call. So... As much as I tell someone to, to toss batteries, I would not feel comfortable trying to make an assumption what those batteries are or could be and low test them with that. that uh, I just think you're setting yourself up for a road call to do that. Yeah, and that's what you're doing. You're making an assumption. And um, I, I wouldn't want that in my truck. The, those batteries become great trade truck batteries. Okay, let's see if we have any other questions come in. Um, yes, a uh, question came in, future plans for web training charging system. We are going to be doing a charging uh, system one in the future. Our one for next month, though, is going to be doing voltage drop training. We're going to try to do these somewhat in order as we would uh, work on a truck. Uh, so the next one we're going to do is, just like if you work on a truck, what's the first thing we got to make sure is right is the batteries. What's the next thing we would check? That would be voltage drop uh, training. So we're going to... Uh, next month cover voltage drop of cranking and charging cables on a truck and same thing of doing voltage drop uh, tests on a lift gate. Okay. 
two very common applications uh, that both are very important. That we got to make sure once we have good batteries, we can get that energy from the batteries to either the, the starter, the alternator, the, the pump motor of a lift gate. So make sure you are signed up uh, to get the, the invite for that. Next one is, do all battery manufacturers use the same date code stamp uh, to find the age of a battery? And that would be no. Um, what, I mean, they're all different. I would, I believe that. Most, yeah, for an actual date code stamp on the battery, they are different. But it's a fairly industry standard for a sticker on the sides of batteries to tell you the age. Um, usually it's going to be an alphanumeric. Um, the first one would be a, a letter that is going to tell you the month. So January would be A, February is B. Um, it goes all the way through M. Uh, if anyone's doing the math real quick, M is actually the 13th letter. They skip I because it looks like a 1. Uh, then the second would be a number, so it may be an, an A5 would tell you that was a uh, January of 2015 battery. Some of them may actually give you two digits, but for the most part, yes, there is a decal that will tell you the age. That most commonly is the born on date. Uh, some battery manufacturers will also put a second sticker on there that tells you the ship date. Uh, worst case scenario, again, it's going to know when that battery was made and uh, your warranty can go by that. One of the biggest things I tell fleets is I would use a paint pen and I would write the date code that you put that battery into a truck if it's a replacement battery or if you're doing uh, in service on trucks use a paint pen right when you put that truck in service because guess when your battery warranty should start should start when you installed that battery yes uh, we got another question that came in what would be the reason for a different cca rating in batteries wired in parallel uh, quick answer to that battery should never have different cca ratings in parallel um, our rule of thumb, you know, if, if and we're going to do a recharge program uh, webinar, and we've done one in the uh, past, is batteries should always be grouped uh, within 50 CCAs of each other. Batteries should always be used within six months of each other. You're trying to keep a battery pack as matched as possible. Um, so the most I would do, for example, would be. Uh, if you had a 650 CCA battery, you might team it with a 700. But I would never go beyond that. Um, that's a, the scary thing that I have seen is you got you know three 700 CCA batteries and Billy Bob Road Service put in a 950 for you. So you wind up with a, a freak battery and it's going to knock your, your battery pack out of whack and it's going to cause you problems. Yeah, you end up with a, an uneven battery. They're all, you know, all charging a different uh, charge characteristic. So you, you end up with an uneven battery pack. Um, we had one question for recommendation. Um, I really don't want to make any you know, firm recommendations on anything. Um, I will follow up directly with you on this question. Um, but we do have recommendations. There's, there is lots of good equipment in the market. Obviously we sell equipment, um, but we don't want this to seem like a, um, a sales presentation. So I will defer that and, and do a follow-up. Next question, in a deep cycle battery, is the difference in, in size of the load plate, lead plates? There is just lots of differences in how batteries are made. Um, one thing is when you, if you're trying to build a battery with high CCAs, you have to make a very porous plate or lots of thin plates because you have to get surface area for that, that chemical reaction to take place. If you're trying to build a deep cycle trolling motor battery, you make a very dense plate so it can handle that cycling, again, that, that contraction and expanding from, from cycling. So they are two totally different, you know, end goals. So battery manufacturers try to find that happy medium uh, to get you a, a good mix of CCAs in reserve capacity. But it is totally based on how... Uh, not only the plates are made, but also how the, the, the paste material that's put on those plates is made and how they are, um, I'm trying to find the right word for it, but how they're, they're allowed to grow that crystal structure and control the, the porosity and the surface area. 
Next question, what type of battery tester do you recommend for a heavy truck application? Um, again, I'm going to defer that one back to uh, reaching directly out and, and answer that. Um, another one, uh, question is, should we change all the batteries at the same time? Um, yes and no. Um, I hate to answer a question with a question, but if you were you had a truck had four batteries in it and you found one bad battery the other three passed low test you know flying colors are good batteries one of them was bad if you could replace that one battery with a matched battery then you went over to your recharge pile and said hey i've got a battery that's the you know within six months and it's within uh 50 ccas it is a good match to its you know brothers and sisters in this battery box then I would replace just that one. The problem is most shops that will never happen. Uh, somebody will grab a battery and put it back in there. Six months from now when it gets another PM, they find another bad battery and it fits another one. Or you wind up with a, a pup from every dog in that battery box and you're destined for failure every time you turn around. So what we would always recommend is you, you pull them all, you run them through the recharge program, and whoever's in your recharge program takes those good recharge batteries and puts them into banks for the technician. Hey, next time he needs four batteries, they've already been gone through. They've been matched up. Here is four good used batteries that are a bank. Next question. How long would you let your battery stay on the shelf before trading it in for a fresh battery up to date? Um... Depends on battery. Uh, AGM batteries are going to have a much longer shelf life than a flooded cell. Uh, so, uh, with a lot of those, you know, especially with thin plate technology, you can go well over a year. Um, even flooded cell, most go six months plus. Uh, probably the biggest thing that I'm ever going to recommend anybody is if you do have batteries that sit on the rack a long time, make sure your battery supplier is rotating them. Um, and if it's a recharge program or whatever, uh, if those batteries do sit around for a while, with the, the smarter you know, battery recharge stations that are available now, is run them across every now and then. Make sure they stay at 100%. Um, battery that stays at 100% can, can have a, a very long shelf life. Um, if you let them get into a discharge condition sit around, then you can very easily have uh, batteries that will go bad sitting. Again, talking about the, the water solution and the electrolytes, you know, discharge batteries when it's sitting in a tube, just somewhere metal sitting in a water solution. So keeping them at a, a full state of charge, um, you know, even sitting, um, sitting in an application is, is crucial for battery life. Uh, do we sell a battery cleaning kit? Um, we do offer all the things we showed you, and if you'd like, we'd be more than happy to reach out to you afterwards uh, with any of the products that have to be in the video. But again, uh, we try to refrain from this being too, too salesy. Um, next question, how many trucks per location does it make sense to have your own testing equipment? Um, that's an easy question. One, uh, that if you're, uh, well, I'm being a little facetious by saying one, but it does not take very many vehicles uh, at all for you to be able to invest in having the right equipment. Um, a battery at your location may cost you $100 or whatever. What's that battery going to cost you on road service? Um, I don't care what it is. A road call is going to cost you 500 bucks minimum. So if you don't have the ability to load test batteries properly, all it takes is a road call and, and buying four batteries on the road to pay for most uh, test equipment like we're talking about today. So it doesn't take a very large fleet. Uh, you know, honestly, 10 trucks or more can benefit by having the right equipment in-house. It's much easier to do all this stuff in-house and much easier to control your costs than having, you know, road failures. Okay, next question. What's better for a lift gate, flooded or AGM? Um, again, going going into talking about cycling um, and that reserve capacity number uh, for a lift gate, you're obviously cycling uh, 
uh, you're not giving those really short bursts, you're cycling that battery. Um, so when we're talking with, about a flooded cell battery, you want that, that high reserve capacity, 180 range. Uh, but with an AGM, typically you get best, you know, the best of both worlds. You get that high CCA plus that high reserve capacity. Okay, and then some of those are just, a, you know, depends on the application. You try to make sure that, you know, uh, you get what you pay for. You know, is the difference in, in cost going to give you enough longer life? Um, but it doesn't matter whether it's a AGM or a flooded cell. If you don't get them charged and keep them charged, none of them work. Next question, drivers leaves, driver leaves lights on weekly. How jump starts are allowed before technician needs to be involved in checking systems? Um, and make sure you know, understand the question properly. That um, None of these things are going to address or fix drivers leaving loads on. Um, obviously, he does that on a regular basis. He's going to greatly shorten the life of those batteries, cycling that hard, taking down to nothing. Uh, so you do have to be, be very careful there. Um, but you do also want to make sure, you know, is it just lights? Does that truck have a parasitic load? Um, is there other things causing those, you know, deeply discharged batteries? So, uh, and I'll be more than happy to reach back out to you on this question, see if there's, there's more insight to it. But uh, uh, If you do have it, you know, jump start issues, whatever you need to look at and find out what the, the core problem is. Is it a battery problem? You know, it could be used batteries. If, if batteries were good, those lights would, would have no problem. But they're three years old and they've lost capacity, so it doesn't take much to, to kill them. So uh, sometimes that's one of the biggest indicators you can get on problems is drivers say, well, I used to be able to watch my TV for, for six hours. Now I only get an hour and a half. Did he change TVs or has he just lost capacity of those batteries? That's going to be the last question we're going to take because we do want to make sure we got time to go into our, our survey questions. So do want to thank you all for, for being here and please stay uh, online here so we can hit the, uh, the survey questions here at the end. If you do have any other questions, feel free to go ahead and type those in. Uh, we'll be happy to, to follow up directly with you. And uh, if you need any, farming, any other information, please don't hesitate to reach out. So we're going to kick off the, the survey questions now.